Welcome to API Conversations number 13 with Simone Mendez. I'm Paul Carr. I've mentioned a few times on various forums that what we mostly hear, for better or worse, is from the loud people, those who are eager and ready to voice an opinion. And I want to talk as much as possible to the quiet people, who I expect have every bit as much of value to say. The quiet people often have stories to tell that no one knows or has experienced. Simone Mendez is one such person, and her story needs to be told as honestly as we can tell it. I first heard of Simone Mendez through Jack Brewer's book, The Greys Have Been Framed, and when I spoke to Jack for Conversation 12 last month, he mentioned her again. Here's a short excerpt. Uh, like the Simone Mendez story uh, that was in my book where she was given in all likelihood fake documents while she was um, holding a security clearance and working at the Area 51 base. And um, then that turned into a pretty traumatic investigation for her about, you know, where who she'd showed them to and that kind of thing that very well may have had some kind of uh, counterintelligence implications to it. Not long after my conversation with Jack came out, Simone Mendez emailed me. She felt she had been unfairly attacked by internet trolls when she had tried to set the record straight on what had happened to her. I asked her if she wanted to come on to this podcast. I've let her tell her story without judgment. Although I did have a few questions, the deeper I dug into the incident, the more questions I had. I spoke to Simone Mendez on her cell phone. The audio quality isn't crisp, but I believe you can understand everything she says. With me this evening, which is the 19th of September, 2018, is Simone Mendez. Now, Simone, I imagine probably fewer than half of my listeners really know who you are. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and and then we'll go into telling your story. Yes, certainly. Okay. Um, I was in the Air Force for a little over seven years back between 1981 and 1988. In 1981, I was working on Nellis in Nevada. It's part of the Nellis Area 51 Test Range Complex. And well, uh, see, see, Nellis is in North Las Vegas, right? North Las Vegas. Yeah, okay. The whole, it's all called the Test Range Complex. Uh -huh. Nellis, yeah, North Las And I lived off base. Most of us airmen lived off base in North Las Vegas in our own apartment, little apartment. Well, let me back up. Have you seen that movie from 1985? It's called The Falcon and the Snowman. Uh, no, I don't believe I have. Or I don't remember it anyway. Oh, well, because it has a work center in there. That was what I did on now. It. Oh. And what I did was cryptographic communications, uh, sensitive data, data processing in a basement room where we had, we worked with incoming and outgoing military communications, also the alphabet letter agencies as well, and we're in access of sensitive material up to TS with code. It pertained to the KH-11 by satellite and before I went in the service as a person in my late teens, living at home with my parents, I had a bunch of UFO sightings, sometimes with a friend or a sibling, and it seemed like there was a black wave going on in the, that region. I have an old magazine with, with a big, long article about all that, and I heard something on my radio, AM radio, about it, too, that, at that time. Well, so... I was smitten with the UFO subject because of that. 
then uh, while I was in my sensitive Air Force job in 1981, sometimes I would see the acronym UFOB in the text, although we were not supposed to sit and read anything, just make sure that to address these or stamp documents. And so one day I was talking to a fellow airman, and me and this person, we, we dabbed kind of quite a bit to each other, and <laughs> he was a man who was uh, about my age and lived with a, a significant other civilian woman off base as well. And we talked in the work center. And sometimes we would talk about UFOs, UFOs. And he told me about his writing too when he was at home. So one morning he comes to my apartment and he has a <laughs> third or fourth carbon copy of the computer printout from those large, large machines that we used to call computers and talked about UFOs coming in from deep space out by the solar system, that's a quote. But he was, he seemed really afraid and shaking and he told me to that just look what I got and then he wanted to turn around and go but leave with it. But I was, uh, but I had it in my hands and I told him I want to hang on to it and he said, well he was disagreeing with me and then he said, you should Put it in an ashtray and burn it <clears throat> when you're done reading it. Just put it in an ashtray and burn it so it don't exist anymore. And uh, he, he said that he, he believed that he, <laughs> he believed that he got away with the, this extra carbon where no one would notice. And I don't know, I, I guess I wanted to believe him at this, as my very young self, very young. And uh, that was in October, and in January of 82, his girlfriend, <clears throat> apparently, they had a bad parting of ways, and she knew about the UFO document and figured I had it. There's, you know, there's... um. A number of things I don't know, so I have to glean, you know. So she went on base and talked to the investigators, and they they said to her, because the conversation that her and them had was that it was probably a, a hoax by him, and they told her to come in over to where I am and make sure I turn it in. So she showed up at my place and said that she will accompany me and until I turn it in to a ship supervisor. So I did. And then later, oh, I'm not sure how much longer after that, I was summoned to the base office of special investigation and the FBI was there, and they had it in a brown folder, and that began a nearly seven-month investigation of me. I suspected of wrongdoing, you know, maybe who knows what other documents I had, but there were polygraphs and interrogations and a search of my apartment, and they wanted to know more than anything else, really, is who did I talk to, who did I show it to, things like that. Did I make copies? Where are the copies? Which I did, I did not do that. So, when, when the whole thing ended uh, in June, July of, and that's per my FOIA releases, of uh, 82, it's like the whole thing never happened, and I went, I, this is really 
kind of both sound unbelievable. But, uh, I wanted to stay in. I didn't have nowhere else to go, so I wanted to stay stay in after all that happened to me, which is, you know, kind of unbelievable sounding, but I guess, I don't know. I mean, I was stressed out, I guess. And so I, I guess they, they gave me a unsensitive desk clerk job, and I, I stayed in until Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan, decided to do this massive budget cut, and I got out under honor, completely completely honorable, but I was asked, are you planning on getting out or staying in? And I said, I want out. So they said, then I have to get out early. Otherwise, it would have been a full eight years, but Ronald Reagan was doing these massive budget cuts, and there's actually a book about it on Amazon. I have a link to it that I saved. I didn't know if someone wrote a book about it because it was so, you know, I guess profound to the federal employees. And that was, I think, in eight, yeah, in eight, 87. And they said, well, he'll have to get out early about six months. Then I think it was, yeah. So do you want to hear more about the, what was in the document? Well, yes. I, do you have any? Yeah, I think that everybody would like to. I mean, I know you don't have a copy of it anymore, but uh, and apparently the FOIA request came up empty on that. But yeah, tell us more about the document. Well, it, it said that. Yeah. You know, now, now, first of all, I always, I always say NORAD, but but it didn't really, it didn't say NORAD actually. It said the Colorado Tracking Station. It didn't say NORAD, but I always called it NORAD because I always assumed, well, that must be what they mean because, you know, what else could they mean? So, which I maintain to this day. So, the Colorado Track Tracking Station picked up a, it's, we used the word cluster of, and then it used the word object, and then it quote unquote said from deep space, deep space, Outside the solar system, they came into the Earth and orbited, and it was it's a high Mach number, like something like I can't remember the Mach number. It was like sixteen or twenty six, and then uh something like that is stuck in my memory. And then uh three of the objects broke off and went into the Soviet Union and hovered around the. And it says, quote, unquote, Moscow International Airport for about an hour. And our AWEC flew all the way up to the Soviet Union and, uh, you know, tra tracking them. And the document was classified top secret. Forward slash for official forward slash eyes only. And so when it was just a third or fourth carbon print out from the print out. But uh, that's, there was a bunch of text, but that's all I can remember. Um, and there was there was a time I had some hospitalization during the investigation because I told a co-worker I was going to harm myself and <clears throat> I, I drew attention to myself so that, I don't know, I needed some attention because I was going through this all along. But um, there was a... <laughs> My memory is like uh, not all there about that. Strangely, I know that that sounds kind of odd, but my memory is not all there about that. And then uh, about one year, one half year after all this was, this whole investigation was all done, probably into '84, probably or '83. Somewhere in there, because uh, I was still on notes in '84. 
I had to go to the Bayes Hospital for a routine reason and had to pick up my medical records. And the clerk searched and searched and came back to me and said, there's no medical records on you at all. And so we'll have to make new ones starting all over from today. Hmm. So, yeah. So, um, when I... I got out in 1988 from my month into the clerk job um, because I was having uh, problems, you know, with depression and uh, stress and I don't know. I wanted to, I didn't think it would be a good idea. They wanted, I mean, they wanted someone to be leadership oriented the longer you were in it. I didn't. I increasingly didn't want anything to do with people, so I got out. And but I was corresponding with a, this one ufologist in 87, 88. And then I, I, I went back home to my hometown, to my parents' house, and it was there that I received over the next three years, I think it was, uh, all my... Freedom of Information Act federal files release, which was instructed to me by the ufologist how to get them, <coughs> which you have some of them there now <coughs> that you told me. In. I do have quite a few questions. One of them, when you, you emailed me initially, you said that you had uh, been attacked by trolls on the internet. Yeah. With misinformation, uh, could you? Did, it's, what would you like to set straight? That they've been saying. Well, see the um, uh, actually it all started with my my original disclosure with the ufologist and his newsletter. There, it wasn't malicious mi misinformation, but things how I behaved with the document wasn't wasn't stated right. It was stated so that it sounded like I would show it to people and go, "Is this real? Is this real?" Is it looked like an imbecile, and that, for some reason, twenty you know, the twenty-seven years on from there, everyone always referred back to that. And then, when everyone was on the internet, every once in a while, someone would find my story and, and put the, that text in there, and internet trolls would. Um, bash me for being an, an idiot. The only, only thing that happened was that I had the document and the civilian woman said, you will accompany me to a shift supervisor. And see, because I was in so much trouble and I was so afraid, I wanted to give this vibe off to the investigators and everyone that I was like, yeah, it's, it's probably a hoax, sure, you know. And I said something to the person I was turning it into, like, is this real, you know? And so I think, and that's where that, is this, you know, is this real behavior myth came from? That's where it came from. Does that make sense to you? Yes, I understand. So... But you only spoke to the shift supervisor, nobody else? No, there was other people in there, but we only we only went to this one person who was that shift supervisor. And uh I I probably said to the ufologist who was making the newsletter story th that moment. And the next twenty seven years that was the albatross around my neck, you know, and which would have thunk that, but okay. Uh, so now, did you? I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but in Jack Brewer's book, where he, which is where I first ran into your story, he talks about how you were a few years after that incident, you were recruited by AFOSI. Yeah, it, it was really odd, really odd. So I went to Oklahoma from Nevada and to continue my unsensitive desk alert work. And one day, the AFOSI, I mean, let's see, yeah, I'm trying to remember now how this happened. I, how did I, 
I wound up at their office. I must have been stung in there, yeah. And I sat down at this great, there's this great big shiny conference table in this big old long room with a giant Air Force I symbol on the wall and a bunch of different agents sitting all around the conference table. So anyway, all these agents and me and the head of counterintelligence, Soviet counterintelligence, said, they think you can help us, you know, uh, and we'll be in touch with you if you want to help us, and we'll be in touch with you every now and then. It was really odd. So... Did they, did they say you wanted, you wanted, they wanted you to join AF OSI, or are they... No, just help them. Oh, just help them, okay. Yeah, yeah. And they weren't even clear on that, but um, later on, they would show up at my, where I worked, and it, they made it, it, they conveyed it to me that all this had to do with the war on drugs, and Nancy Reagan just say no to drugs, and that they, they said to me that, uh, and this is so, I don't know, I mean, I almost don't have words. It's like they would ask me to give them a log book, you know, and because they wanted to look at names, you know, in my unsensitive discord work about the comings of and goings of certain people. It was like real mundane things like that, and, so that was me helping them in their war on drugs. And <clears throat> now I want to clear up. There's another mis, no more, I guess, misinformation. Uh, this ufologist named George Hansen wrote a book called The Trickster in the Paranormal. Yes. Okay. And he, <clears throat> now George Hansen never, never contacted, never talked to me ever. He, he got this information from I don't know what hand the source was, <clears throat> not me, where I was, let's see, I can't, I can't recall exactly what he put, but it, when I read it, I, I said, this is incorrect, too. So I want to tell, I befriended, see, this is so complicated, I don't know where to start sometimes. On the base, I, I befriended a move, move on person. The state, actually, the state director of MOFON, this um, woman, and she was kind of like a parent figure for me. What? Because, um, yeah, she she reminded me of a like a a mother figure. She was like a mother figure. So <clears throat> I think that's why I was friends with her. She was older. She was going to American University in D.C. where. William Moore would present the MJ-12 papers for the first time, him, uh -oh, which him and Jamie Shandere got, and that would be 87, I think. And she was going through that, and she asked me, you want to go? Because I had some leaves coming up. And I, it, I thought, wow, it would be nice to go on vacation. And uh, I always wanted to see D.C. I've never seen it. And go to the different things there. So she said, come with me to the MOFON conference in D.C. <clears throat> and I, I mentioned that uh, I was in a little conversation with a visiting OSI guy, and he, I mentioned my leave, and he, he said, where was I going, and what was I doing? And I told him, and he goes, oh, that sounds exciting. You can give me a report about it uh, when you come back. So I went there, and some of the ufologists I was talking to, I, you know, I, I mentioned that to them, and they, they gave me um very, like, angry look and uh, shunned me, kind of, kind of shunning. So, but when I came back to the base, after that was all done, there was no meeting with him or report, because he, he forgot all about it, supposedly, uh, because he didn't asked me, you know, he didn't come and say, okay, so what happened at the conference? I need names. Not, nothing like that happened at all. <clears throat> he, he was just, when he said, oh, that sounds exciting, you'll have to give me a report on it when you come back. It was like when people say, I, I'm going to call you tonight, and they totally don't mean it. They, 
they just don't even remember they said it an hour later. He was he was kind of uh he was he he was a personality like that. Hmm. So that's what happened there. Now did did your friend and, and Mufon, did she know about the document? Oh yeah, yes, yes. And we were under surveillance probably by OSI because um See, she lived in Norman, Oklahoma, and I lived in Midwest City or De- Dell sometimes. Because I changed apartments because I don't like noise. <clears throat> but anyway, and so I would visit her in Norman at her house, her meet her family. She was she was a engineer. Civilian engineer like GS11 or GS12 with a clearance. And she was close friends with Walter Andrus, the then head of Mulsanne. So, uh, she knew about all about it, but Mulsanne was, mm, they were like, they, they wanted to pretend they, they didn't even know I went through that. <laughs> like, it was a non issue. I could tell in our phone conversations, sometimes we would hear people talking in the background and they would hang up. And so before I, I came in the service and I was still living at home in the late 70s and I was having my sightings, I made a, I had a little brown diary and I drew all the times and pictures of my sightings and I still had an army in, in Oklahoma and it was in my purse. Oh, I could... I went to go visit her and show her my brown book. And then uh, I then I went home, and it was in my purse, and a man came running at me full speed as I was coming into my apartment door, and he grabbed my purse. And uh, so those were strange things that happened. But, uh, hmm. yeah. Uh, and... Now this, this, but, friend, this um, friend of yours. Uh, now, I don't know if this is a true story or not, but in the uh, the newsletter that went out from the ufologists, uh, they said that you had had some ufology friends, which they, they gave a I think a pseudonym of George to him, and you were going to contact George, not his real name, and in Oklahoma, and he said he would wanted to see you, but then you called him and he he wouldn't talk to you. And then- no, oh no, no. There was uh, I had I had these two civilian friends. One of the civilian friends was from my hometown with me, and we saw the UFOs in the sky in my hometown before I went into the military. Now, this person, we we were friends in my hometown. We became friends because we were both deep into the born again fundamentalist. Pentecostal Christianity, and we would um, go to Christian coffee houses and listen to rock bands and get Christian literature and have Bible studies. And so, um, well, when I went into the service, she moved out to Texas and got her a, a boyfriend out there. And one one wrong thing I did when I was in all the trouble was that. I I told her verbally <laughs> on the telephone, uh, you know, that um, I have something about UFOs, you know. Well, so when I went to Oklahoma, her her boyfriend wanted to come visit me. They had broke long broken up, long since broken up, and he wanted to come visit me because he was obsessed with UFOs in the military and um, he was supposed to call me and my my landline phone in my off-base apartment never rang and he became enraged and i guess he decided to here's here's another that's another area where all i can do is glean i don't know exactly what happened after that a reporter with with omni magazine was was calling calling me. I I just assume that the boyfriend so to speak sicked him on me, you know. And um 
I think I told I told my supervisor and lieutenant that a reporter from Omni Magazine was after me. Can I talk to him a little bit? But uh, the authorities, him and I guess maybe people over him, they uh, they freaked out over that. And I went home on leave because my youngest brother was having a big wedding. And while I was home on leave, um, this lieutenant would call me at home at my parents' house and threaten me that I better not have anything to do with that reporter from Omni Magazine. <laughs> then when I came back to the base, I never heard from him again. The, the lieutenant was somebody that uh, supervised you? Yeah. Okay. That's odd. Okay. I have, I'd like to back up a little bit to the original incident and see if I, I know you don't know, you may not have all this information, but if you don't, that's okay. I just wanted to find out if you do or not. Um, you can ask me anything you want, anything. I don't okay. care. I'm open. I'm... This friend of yours who gave you the document, uh, the pseudonym was Airman Green in one of the documents I read. Yeah, uh, that's a, a pseudonym. I know what his name is, but it's not that. Yeah. What happened to him? Uh, did he get in trouble too? Yeah, and while I was in trouble, see, they, um, he was being, I, I had picked up somehow that he was being questioned too, and, you know, he was in kind of a similar trouble as me. I asked some officers uh, what's going on with him, and they said, I do not have a need to know. That's what they said to me. Uh huh. But you didn't see him again after that. That's correct. Uh huh. Uh, he he was a okay. He was an Air Force uh, enlisted person like yourself, right? Yeah, about my age, rank. Yeah. Uh, now the girlfriend was she a, a Nellis employee? Well, no, no, she wasn't. Uh, but the OSI um made it so that she could look. Um, they arranged it so that she would be authorized to bring me all the way up to my work center. That's odd. I mean, why didn't they just why didn't they just come for you themselves? Because, uh, you know what? I don't know. Uh, I don't know, actually. And, no. and, she, and she was very, it sounds like she was very authoritative when she came to you. Like she said, you will come with me. Yeah. Do you know what she did for a living? No, I don't. Uh huh. Uh, and did you see her again after that? No. Uh huh. And th at that point, they had broken up, right? The, she and the and Airman Green had broken up. Well, from what I glean, glean I can't say anything hard factually. I, all I can say is what I glean. You and I are like that. Well, I'm trying to figure out why I mean, she was talking to the OSI in the first place. It was just to get back at her boyfriend, or but you don't know. Well, from what I from what I had picked up, it, it was like he he showed her the UFO document first when they were still getting along, and, and uh, but then she came to um, maybe he said to her, maybe he said to her, "Oh, it's not real. It's <laughs> it's it's not it's not really a real." You know, but I don't know for sure. Okay, so I I understand. Uh, it's uh, one of those uh, question marks in my mind. That's all. Um, now you did you lose your clearance right away when they started investigating you, or did they take it away later? That's uh, probably. I don't know. Because they saw, you were assigned to non-sensitive work after that, right? So. Yeah, after everything was out. Oh, while I was under investigation, uh, and uh, I couldn't go back into the message center because I was under investigation, they needed, to, you know, for me to do something. So they they put me in the switch in a switchboard with these civilian ladies who were telephone operators and who would take people's calls and uh, who wanted to call like the some office in and uh whatever and so I sat in there. I sat in the switchboard. I see. And uh I took I just took all I did was 
this was civilian ladies, and all I did was take telephone calls and uh, where people wanted to call different buildings and put them through, and that, and so that, but that wasn't going to be my permanent job yet until until everything was all done, and they were trying to figure out until they knew that I wanted to stay in, and then they had to give me a more permanent, longer-term job, which was which had to do with giving people rooms when they came visiting for what was called TBY from other bases. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay, uh, now, so you never got your top secret back? No, no. Oh. Yeah, now, when, when you were cleared of wrong, criminal wrongdoing, did they tell you explicitly, you're cleared, you're not in any trouble anymore, or did they just go away? Everything just went away, and I, and they was all it was was a bunch of uh, paperwork and putting me into my my new permanent uh, unsensitive job, mm -hmm. like that. Now you never hired a lawyer during this time, right? No, because I was not familiar with being in federal trouble. <laughs> I understand. I mean, I was I came straight from a my parents' house out there, and I was just a young kid, and I, you know, I had no uh, familiarity with being in federal trouble, and so I, I thought, well, I'm, I'm innocent. I just did a couple of no-nos, but they're not. But I didn't do crimes. I did no-nos, and so they'll, they'll see it all wash out, you know. But it took almost seven months for it to all wash out, <laughs> and that mm -hmm. was really stressful. I understand. Uh, you were, you know, and you mentioned you were hospitalized during some of that time, right? Yeah. And you, your memory of that hospitalization is spotty at best, you would say. Spotty. Spotty. And, uh, yeah. And went, and then my medical records w went away and they had to make new ones. Right. Now, and did you, did you file a FOIA request for your medical records later? No. No. You know what? Um, I only settled for the all the FOIA stuff that the, the ufologist helped me get when I came back home, and and uh, because as a civilian in the early 1990s, um, ufology, and I mean the oh, you know, the organizational so-called private ufology UFO researchers, <clears throat> other than other than the one I was dealing with, they, they reacted negatively to me, like I needed to shut up and go away. And like one of them sent me a postcard, which I still have, that said, drop it and you can do your artwork for us. And so because, now my point is because of that, it made me feel like, well, why should I work on getting it? Any other documentation, you know, to hell with it. That was my attitude. I'm, I'm tired of this, you know, rejection and, and I wanted, I wanted someone to, um, be interested and, and, I don't know, feel supportive toward me and be a friend. And, uh, but everyone was like, ah, you know, uh, like uh, I was a complete. The person who sent me it has, has not been active in ufology for, I would say, uh, probably, well, for a very long time, more than 20 years or 25 years. Back to the document itself, uh, which I know that uh, you didn't get a copy of. There are some, some of the FOIA documents make the argument that it was a hoax. But the, the question I have is, you must have seen documents similar to that a lot in your work. Did it look authentic to you? Yeah, it 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 looked authentic. That's why I uh, I didn't think it I didn't think it was real. You know, when I had it, I, except the classification is something I had not seen before on anything else. And so um, so when everyone was surrounding me, going, it's it's a hoax and. I was like, well, yeah, that strange classification on the top and bottom. I, you know, I'm unfamiliar with it, so maybe he made it up. And yeah, it could be, you know, a hoax. Now, a long, a long time later, and I'm talking like 
only um, in the past five years, I would I would sit on the internet and I would. Uh, do you know what I learned that AKH11 was launched only a couple of weeks before the airman gave me the UFO, you know, document, and also, and I have that link, and then uh, I learned that very recently on the internet that the, the uh, KH-11 capability was revealed when the National Reconnaissance Office gave NASA two, two telescopes that are KH-11 like, it says in the article. And they said that um, because the mirrors were, were so advanced, more than the Hubble telescope, and this, but but this was secret for thirty six six or thirty five or thirty six years prior to prior to twenty twelve, and uh, so now like going on forty something years, you know, um, that it was secret, and only came out recently in like space space website, and then, uh. This for official in in the classification for official. The only one thing I knew was for official use only. F O U O, and I learned on the internet that F O U O is not subject to quote unquote mandatory F O I A for official. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, for whatever that's worth, maybe nothing. Then I learned on the internet that uh, NORAD has these, um, they're called eyes and ears, eyes and ears uh, space tracking agencies that, for NORAD, either eyes and ears, that track close or near Earth things and Outside the solar system in deep space for comets and asteroids. And I have, and I saved all these links. I got them. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is, uh, do you think Airman Green would have had the skill to fake this document, or maybe you just didn't know him well enough? Knowing him, me, the short time actually that I knew him. I, I can't believe he came up with that. I can't believe it. He was he was a a young African American man who hailed from Florida, and he didn't seem uh, intellectual to do that. But you never know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you must have thought about it a lot. And, and Jack Brewer in his book said. He, he he says he's not sure, but that maybe this was some kind of counterintelligence operation. Does that yeah, st- strike I, ring I, true I to you? Ultimately, um, and, and Jack says this is Jack quotes to me in his book at the very end of the chapter that I'm that is about me. At the very end of it, I say that I really have no stance on it. I mean. Because we were like, yeah, it could could have been a CI op, and but also, but at the end, at the end, I have no quote unquote, I have no stance on it, which is which is, uh, I decided that, uh, is you know, I had, I mean, I can't, uh, don't all I can do is have no stance on it. See what I mean? Because what you know, you just don't know. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fair enough. Before we wrap this up, I just wondered if there's anything else you'd like the public to know about your story. It's very stressful going over this, all this stuff. It's very stressful. But I do it, you know, I do it because and cause someone asked me, well, why are you why are you whistleblowing like this then? <laughs> because you could get killed. <laughs> and it, my answer is I'm of two minds. I'm, I'm of two different minds and hearts about it. Like, I, I probably, it's probably not a good idea to be on about it, you know, to, but, but at the same time, it, it's like, uh, 
I can't keep it to, to myself either. It's too hard to. It's too, because what I went through was like, you know, out of this world. And it was uh, a long time. It was. And so I'm of two minds, hearts and minds about it, and which are conflicting. That it's uh, scary for me, and, and uh, then I want to talk about it. I mean, can you imagine, like, having something that, well, I shouldn't talk about it, and it's stressful, and but, but I can't stand holding it in and keeping it to myself. Well, fair enough. Uh, all right. Uh, and I, I very much appreciate your time and uh, your courage in coming out and telling your story. All right. Well, thanks a lot, thank Simone. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. I'd like to thank Simone Mendez once again for coming on API Conversations. I sense that this was stressful for her, and perhaps you can hear a bit of nervousness in her voice. I let her review the audio of this interview before release, and she did not ask me to remove anything. I'd like to point out that I have additional material on Simone Mendez, including copies of some of the FOIA documents she received in the early 1990s after she left the Air Force. Simone does not want me to release any of what I have, and I will respect that request, since I think that what she has said here stands on its own. Of course, I am not going to release her contact information, but if you have questions, you can contact me using our contact form at apicasefiles.com, or you can email at either apicasefiles at gmail.com or report at ufo at protonmail.com. Here are some of my thoughts to conclude. First, in my judgment, Simone Mendez is telling us the truth as best as she can remember it, and she has documents obtained by the FOIA process that back up her story. I've seen copies of some of the more important ones. The story stands out to me because of parallels with other activities by counterintelligence agencies in the 1980s. There was a well-documented gaslighting of Paul Benowitz, as documented in Greg Bishop's book Project Beta, the disinforming of Linda Moulton Howe, the MJ-12 documents, the UFO cover-up live television show, and more. One recurring pattern is that the target of the operation has had an existing interest in UFOs. And as we have just heard, Simone Mendez had witnessed UFOs before she joined the Air Force and had made sketches of them. I mentioned earlier that I had a lot of questions. Here are eight of them, any one of which might admit to a simple, mundane explanation, but taken together are a bit puzzling. 1. The inexplicable missing document itself. I can easily accept that this document was probably a hoax, but even with the FBI's detailed argument that it is, it is bogus, I'm still not sure. What is clear is that someone had the ability to create a document that looked authentic to a trained communication specialist. I'm also puzzled as to why there were carbon copies of an eyes-only document. Maybe someone out there listening can help clarify that. Airman Green ostensibly took a copy he didn't think would be missed, which also strikes me as improbable, since all copies of classified documents are hand-to-hand -hand accountable. Also, NORAD's radar, even now, cannot track objects in deep space, so this may have been a giveaway. 2. Airman Green himself is a puzzle. We don't know what happened to him, and as you just heard, Simone Mendez was denied any information. I don't know if he had the skill or resources to fake the document himself, and I think it's more likely he received it from someone else and was manipulated into finding it. Was Mendez the target of this operation? Or was Green? 3. Airman Green's girlfriend 
is a strange character in all this. I don't understand her behavior in this case or how she got involved. Mendez states that she never saw her again. 4. The extended interrogations over several months of Herman Mendez, many involving polygraphs, although she was not under arrest. If they really thought she was a security risk and was suspected of espionage of top-secret material, wouldn't she be confined? 5. The memory gap Mendez experienced while she was hospitalized. 6. The missing medical records at Nellis. 7. Her recruitment by OSI later when she was in Oklahoma, and eight, the snatching of her purse containing her notebook. Hopefully, more information will surface someday. If Airman Green or his ex-girlfriend is to, are still alive and willing to talk about it, then perhaps a lot could be cleared up. But with events that occurred over 30 years ago, no doubt much information is irretrievably lost. If you do know more, you can contact us on our encrypted Swiss-hosted email Report a UFO at protonmail.com. As always, your identity will not be released. One final thing. If you do come across Simone Mendez online, be civil to her. As you have just heard, she's a human being. She went through a tough time as a young person, but that was a long time ago. She finds interaction with mean people in the cyberverse to be very distressing so don't be one of those. Okay, if you have anything you want to say about this episode of API Conversations, this one is number 13, or anything else on API case files, then please do so. You can comment directly on the blog entry for this episode at apicasefiles.com, where you will find everything you want to know about API case files and API, including our citing report form. You can also go directly to our sighting report form using the URL reportaufo.org. As always, we respect witness privacy and anonymity. If you want to help, we're not looking to add any more field investigators until next year, but we could use some specialized volunteer help, including case analysts on standby to examine videos, photographic, or medical evidence. Help with the website with video and audio production would be helpful as well as we're starting to spin up our video channel in earnest. Just let us know if you want to help. We'll have a link in the show notes. This has been API Conversations 13. API Conversations and API Case Files are a production of Aerial Phenomena Investigators. Music is by Josh Lippy and the Overtimers and... DJ Spooky. API Case Files and API Conversations are released under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike License. Desert Oracle Radio, the voice of the desert.